Hi, Matt Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Brewer Science with Jim Lamb. is going to talk about using DSA with EUV. Jim, when we think about EUV and DSA, they've typically been separate worlds. They, there was one or the other. Why are they coming together now? Hey, when we look at setting the guide patterns for a DSA structure, we need to generate a pattern that's small, our target pattern. So typically we're looking at 15 nanometers or less pattern size when we're doing with DSA, the line width, half pitch. And for that, I need to have that 15 nanometer line to build my guide off of. If I do that with 193, I get the best line I can produce with that is like 40 nanometers. And I either have to trim etch it or overexpose it to get it down to the point it's that small a line, or I have to do quadruple patterning of it and trim that down to get to the size lines that I need. With EUV, I can directly print the size line that I need in a single shot for generating my guides for DSA. And when we talk about 15 nanometer lines, these are not necessarily 15 nanometer nodes, right? That is correct. Uh, the, the, if you, you look at it, so your most critical dimension now on a, a logic device might be 9, 10 nanometers for the distance in between a fin or for the top edge of a fin. Uh, but typically the structures you need for metal lines and things of this nature are going to be in the 20 nanometer realm. Why don't you draw this out for us? Okay, be glad to. What are we looking at here? Okay, we're going to look at, uh, go through the process of building uh, a structure out of EUV and using that small pattern that I talked about earlier. So we're going to build um, the process flow here. For EUV, we have a layer that's always using EUV. It's called an assist layer or an adhesion layer. It goes beneath the resist. It helps. Uh, improve the uh, photo dose, it reduces the dose, and actually helps improve uh, LER and LWR for, for the, EB, uh, the EUV resist. And so we're going to use that very same layer as our guiding material. We're just going to use it in a much thinner layer. So typically we're putting down on this substrate, so we take silicon here, we put a SOC, it's a spin on carbon layer or a carbon hard mass, those are the things it's typically known as. And this is what you're going to do your hard work with of transferring images into deep structures. So we want to get this thin, uh, small uh, line width pattern transferred into this SOC. So that's what we're going to walk through in this process. How do we take this and transfer that 15 nanometer lines and spaces into this SOC material. So on top of this, we have a hard mask. We'll need a hard mask to do this transfer. In this case, we're gonna use a very thin hard mask. It's gonna be maybe uh, eight to 10 nanometers thick, very thin hard mask. The assist layer usually is 15 nanometers. In this case, we want to be as thin as possible. So we're, we're, we're gonna do chemo epitaxy here which means we're going to use the chemistry of that surface to drive our, uh, our uh, directed assembly. And so this is a five nanometer film. And then photoresist is uh, typically around 15 to 20 nanometers thick as well. So if you think about it, these are all very thin layers. And we're going to try to transfer that into uh, a 25 or 30 nanometer thick SOC, which allows us to have enough etch resistance to get this into silicon oxide or the silicon itself, depending on what we're trying to pattern down here. What are you trying to solve here? Does this actually reduce time in the fab? Does it allow you to do things that you couldn't do with just EUV? Does it improve quality? Where's the upside? At, at this stage, we're just trying to show equivalence with EUV and, and hopefully demonstrate that you can get improved LER, LWR out of using the, uh, the, sim, the direct self-assembly type processes. So th that's initial. So some of the early work we did, we, we called it EUV rectification. 
So we actually were just trying to sharpen up the structures that we already put down with EUV, not trying to do multiplication. Uh, but what it would, the goal of this really is to be able to do multiplication, where we can take and trim down with dose those EUV lines from 15 nanometers to 10 and maybe even to 5 nanometers by trimming them and then using those to do a, a multiplication to get like 5 nanometer lines. So we don't need those today, but this gives you a pathway to those kind of very small structures without having to move to high NA EUV. Is high NA EUV the alternative? Maybe. Uh, you, when you go up high NA EUV, these issues of dose and focus uh, latitude, your process latitude shrinks dramatically. So then you got an issue, can you control that process well enough? And we think the DSA process probably will have a lot more control. But that's something that has to be proven out in time and in, in, in experimentation. Can you walk through some of the process steps for us so we get a little more insight here? Okay, so initial thing, we're, we're going to do standard EUV uh, patterning. So we'll go in here and, and we can start either with, if we're doing rectification, we will print exactly the structures we want. So uh, we'll do a, a 30 nanometer pitch. So we end up with Fifteen nanometer lines and spaces. So if you do just rectification, we're going to transfer that down. But if you do uh, at this stage, uh, you'll go in and we're going to etch that in. So we'll go into a plasma etch. We're going to remove uh, the resist gets developed. Then we go into the plasma etch, an oxygen based plasma etch. And that's going to transfer this layer into this assist layer. So we're left with a five nanometer thin layer of material on this substrate. We're going to etch or use a, a, a solvent system to remove the resist. We don't need it anymore. So that's going to thin the resist down. If we want to, we can over etch or we can over expose. So those are other ways you can move the process. So you can make this line half of what it is here. So if I was doing 15 nanometer, I just move this to a seven and a half nanometer line and space process by just over exposing or uh, uh, doing a trim etch. If you go down to a smaller line in space, does that affect what you do here as well? Do the layers get thinner? Do the spaces get thinner? What happens? Uh, no, but we are starting very thin. So if you look compared to what people would normally do in the EUV process, they would be using um, uh, almost 2 to 3x thickness of uh, hard mass and also of the assist layer. And so you, you have a lot bit larger layers you're going to transfer through. And that's part of the technology that we have to deliver the customer is how do you get reliable thin films that are uniform, pinhole free, defect free. That's uh, the, the edge that we have to bring on the chemical side for this technology to be viable. And a defect of a nanometer typically wouldn't show up as some of the older nodes, but in this case, it has a big difference, right? Yes, and that's something we have worked with uh, in, in most of our life in business is uh, we worked with always very thin films. Uh, so anti-reflective coatings are always one-tenth or less of a photoresist thickness. So we're always at that edge of the defect detection technology. And so if you can imagine, you got a five nanometer film, you have a one or two nanometer defect, that's a boulder. And if that film tends to pull away or pull onto it, you've magnified that defect into a 10 or 20 nanometer size defect. And so we, we have to be very good with what we're producing here as a chemical and the cleanliness of it. So what comes next year? 
Okay, now we're going to apply uh, the direct self-assembly to a block copolymer material. And those materials have to be specifically designed for the line width that you're wanting to achieve. So we have to have a very specific uh, block copolymer material designed for this specific line width that you're trying to print. And so uh, this uh, 5 nanometer material here, you get preferential wetting for one of the components in the block copolymer to the top of this adhesion layer in a different wetting or a neutral uh, wetting to the place in between. And what happens is on this guide, we, we coat this with the BCB material. Uh, in this case, they're, they're usually typically polystyrene and PMMA components in it, which have different wetting to these materials. The polystyrene will stack up on top of this material and the uh, PMMA will be here, so P. And that stacking goes right across here. To give this multiplication here. So we, we've taken this one structure here and made one and made three structures out of it. So we were multiplying uh, that device. After that, uh, we'll go in and etch. So there's an etch preference. When we go in and etch this, the PMMA etches two, three times faster than the polystyrene. So we go into a plasma etch process. We're going to remove the PMA component. And give us these polystyrene blocks that are seven and a half nanometers. And the thing that's different here from lithography, uh, when, you, when you do this by direct lithography, you're worried about focus, aerial image intensity, all those things are factors here. Here the factor is really the wetting and the assembly of the chemistry. Okay, so there's some different factors that you have to really manage. Okay, when, when you compare like a DSA in this chemical assembly off of these blocks, um, yeah, you just have a preference then that drives how these materials align. And by the chemistry, the, the molecular weight of each of these blocks, you set your uh, uh, period for your pattern. In litho, you have all these uh, thresholds for dose, for focus, where you have these very uh, uh, slopes instead of a high intensity edge. You don't get the ideal in lithography of a light intensity. It's like that. You get something that's like that that you're doing your imaging with. And so you have, a, you have to really control this to get the image you want here. This way, uh, we think this is where we will achieve better LER, LWR uh, for these kind of small line systems with, chem uh, with a direct self-assembly. What will this do in terms of time that you take to actually develop a new chip? Uh, that is a really good question. Uh, there has just been... Uh, in very recent years what you would have to have to design a new chip. So these components of DSA and block copolymer have to be built into the design uh, tools that the industry uses. And they are, but they're still kind of in the early days or infancy yet. And so uh, until those design tools can be used to validate uh, these kind of processes uh, at these scales for these particular, particular BCBs, uh, it's going to take a lot more energy because you're going to have to pull the design tool with it. Once those are done, though, then this becomes a fairly quick thing to do. So how does this move down into the, your SOC process? Okay, so what we need to do is we need typically a dense thick etch mass to do our transfer either into a deep silicon or to build a thin structure or to, to etch a deep uh, high aspect ratio uh, uh, hole or, or line set. In any of those cases, these materials are too thin to provide sufficient etch mass. So we're going to transfer this by using a uh, 
a fluorinated etch into these hard mass materials. And you may have some of this material up here. And then we're going to go back into an oxygen plasma and transfer this into a dense carbon material. That's at the thickness that we need. That'll typically remove all of this material and leave us, make sure we get the right ones, with this image in a thick, uh, a highly cross-linked, high carbon density material to give us the etch resistance we need to go down into silica and silicon oxide or whatever material that you need. Jim Lamb, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you. I enjoyed this very much.